It's Christmas Eve 2002, and 31-year-old Scott came home expecting to see his 27-year-old wife, Lacey, who in a little, the pair were supposed to head to her parents' house for dinner. She was probably out shopping, so he didn't really worry. But now it's 5 p.m. and she hasn't been back yet. Another thing that was weird to him was that before he left the house that morning at 9.30 a.m., he filled the mop bucket with water because she wanted to mop the house that morning. And when he returned home, the bucket was still full. At 5.17 p.m., he calls Lacey's mother to see if she was maybe already there. She wasn't, and they haven't heard from her either. Scott then tells her that Lacey is missing. Her stepfather, Ron Gransky, calls the police to report that eight-month pregnant Lacey and her unborn baby, Connor, are missing. Hello and welcome to our podcast. I am your host, Amadi, and here with me is the lovely... Grin. And this is a place where we don't shy away from gruesome details where some things may be triggering and hard to hear. So listener's discretion is advised. And now let's talk about dark shit. Let's do it. I'm going to apologize because I know last year, or last year, last week, we had to skip it because I got sick. I lost my voice. And as you can tell, my voice is not back yet. I apparently have bronchitis. So this is going to be my voice for another few weeks. So I'm not going to be talking as loud. But at least my voice isn't as quiet as it was the past couple of days. So at least this isn't going to be like an ASMR <laughs> episode. Which I feel like some people don't mind, right? Let us know. <laughs> oh, and then may I add real quick that this, I think this is the kind of sickly voice that Amadi had back when she sent me a snap a long time ago. And then I was the one who told her, Amadi, you need to start a podcast because your voice is very soothing right now. I know you're sick, but it sounds soothing. Please only do a podcast or an episode when you're sick and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this story is about Lacey Peterson. Now, the reason I looked into this is because it was, well, actually it was a listener recommendation. Thank you, Jennifer. Ooh, thank you. But also because recently, as of January of this year, mind you, this all happened in 2002, the LA-based organization of the Innocence Project, an organization that works to free the innocent and prevent wrongful convictions by using DNA. Well, that organization decided to represent the husband of Lacey Peterson, Scott. They feel that Scott's constitutional rights have been violated, including a claim of actual innocence that is supported by newly discovered evidence. But before we go any further with recent news, let's go back to the beginning of this highly popular case and give you all a refresher and to those who have never heard it, new information about Lacey Peterson. Lacey Peterson, born as Lacey Denise Rocha on May 4th, 1975 from Modesto, California, known as the Central Valley. Born to parents Sharon and Dennis Rocha and sibling to Brent, Amy, and Nathan. Family and friends would describe Lacey as always smiling. She was bubbly, talkative, and usually the center of attention. She was basically an all-American girl. Her stepfather, Ron, even nicknamed her Jabberjaw. In high school, she attended Thomas Downey High, and there she was described as vivacious, outgoing, friendly, and a cheerleader. For college, she attended California Polytechnic Institute in San Luis Obispo to major in horticulture since she developed a love for cooking and gardening. While there, at a cafe that she would frequent, she noticed one of the workers, Scott Peterson, from San Diego, who was also a Cal Poly student, born on October 24th, 1972, son to Lee and Jackie Peterson. Scott was described as a young boy who was rarely in any trouble. He was quiet and he was polite. He had a love of golf and was even a part of the University of San Diego High School golf team. I'm going to describe this real quick as I was so 
confused when I read that. University of San Diego High School. I wasn't sure if I was reading, like, was he in university or is he in high school? That's the name of the high school. I just had to clear that up real quick because I was confused for a little. Like a, like that's the straight up name or is it like a type of program? No, no? no that's the name of the high school. Wow. University. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't heard that one. So the type of person that I described Lacey was, you can probably already tell that she was the one to approach Scott first. She slipped him her phone number and waited for him to call. She is a pretty girl, so it honestly didn't take that long for, for Scott to call and ask her out. The couple married on August 7th in 1997 in Sycamore Mineral Resort near San Luis Obispo after dating for only two years. December of that year, Lacey had graduated from Cal Poly, so she immediately applied for a job that is in the field of what she graduated from in Richmond, which is four hours away from San Luis Obispo. Scott supported her decision in moving and made a plan to move to the Bay Area when he graduates as well. They spoke all the time on the phone. They would see each other on the weekends and sometimes in the middle of the week. But not long after moving, Scott began to cheat on Lacey with a Cal Poly sophomore. I don't know how long it lasted, it was said by her mother in a book that she wrote that she believes Lacey kind of knew what was going on because Lacey had a talk with her mother that Scott is, well, he was living with three other guys, three other single guys as roommates, and he was acting like he was single as well, even though he was married. So by her saying that to her mother, that gave the impression like, I think he's cheating. I think she knows he's cheating. What a sleaze. I know. Uh, but I feel like in those type of situations, so I've heard, um, you kind of get like an intuition sometimes. Yeah, that's what, yeah, that's what they say. That couples just, they kind of just know. Well, some couples. Yeah. But I mean, it's like, you know, this person, like, unless they like really masquerade it, like I do, do a good job masquerading it, but. That's true. June of the next year, Scott graduated, but he didn't want to leave San Luis Obispo. So Lacey, she put her marriage first. She quit her job in Richmond and moved back to be with Scott in San Luis Obispo. <laughs> Soon after, in 1999, they opened up a burger cafe called The Shack, where Scott would flip burgers and Lacey did all the decorating and hosting. It was actually a pretty popular hangout for the college kids, but it eventually became too much for the pair, and they ended up selling it in early 2000. After selling the shack, they eventually ended up moving to Modesto, California to be closer to Lacey's family. When they moved there, Lacey took a job as a part-time substitute teacher, and Scott became a fertilizer salesman. Now, we're going to go to the morning of Christmas Eve 2002. Scott helped Lacey by filling up the mop bucket since she wanted to mop that house that day. They also spoke about their day that Lacey was going to walk their dog Mackenzie and afterwards go shopping, while Scott was going to go golfing that day. After Scott left that morning between 9.30 and 10.30, Lacey went for a morning walk with her dog. Scott comes back home around 4.30 p.m., and notices that their dog was in the backyard, in the yard, but still had leash on. He also noticed that the mop bucket was still full and that her car was in the driveway, but she wasn't in the house. He then starts to get ready for Christmas Eve dinner at her parents' house. He takes off his clothes that were slightly damp, puts them in the washer, and starts the washer, dries it and everything. Afterwards, he notices that all the voicemails that he left her, plus a call from Sharon, Lacey's mother, was still on the answer machine. So then he calls Sharon to see if Lacey was there. And then uh, Sharon said, no, she hasn't been there. She's not there yet. And that's when he told her that she was missing. Scott calls the hospitals in case there was an accident and goes to all the neighbors to see if they have seen her. Ron, her stepfather, was the one who called the police to report her missing at 5.47 p.m. The police meet with Scott at a nearby park called East La Loma 
since he was searching, and they head back to the house where they start the investigation. Now, we all know that the spouse is the first person police look at, and that's probably because they're the ones closest to the victim. Yes. But police had their reasonings for actually being suspicious of Scott. So Scott had originally told authorities that he was going to that he was going to go golf that morning. But then he tells them he changed his mind last minute since it was too cold to go golfing and decided to go fishing instead at the Berkeley Marina. Later in the night is when they find out that Mackenzie was put in the backyard when she was found alone in the front yard with her leash on by one of the neighbors. When questioned about his fishing trip, Scott couldn't even remember what type of bait was used He was hesitant of of the police to take pictures of his boat that he kept in the shop and of getting receipts for the pink slipper and sunglasses that the tracking dogs used to capture Lacey's scent. He was just very weird about it all, according to a detective that spoke with police or police that spoke with people. Yeah, it sounds a bit fishy. No pun intended. (laughs) Another suspicious thing was that the next day on Christmas Day, police came back with a search warrant and Scott hesitated to cooperate and to refuse a polygraph. That's twice already. Another thing that Lacey's mom thought was weird was that he said he went fishing and they didn't even know he bought a boat. He didn't even tell Lacey he bought a boat. So they thought it was weird because in the book that Lacey's mother wrote, she said she didn't, nobody knew that he bought a boat. And if he bought a boat and was going to go fishing, why didn't he ask her husband, Ron, to go fishing? Because he loved going fishing. So she thought that was really weird. And they didn't really know of Scott to be like a fisher. Is it fisher? Fisherman. Things aren't adding up, but mm-hmm. I feel like you're going to make it make sense. <laughs> <laughs> so please continue. The police said that he seemed more concerned with protecting himself and not acting like a man who was missing his wife and unborn son. Oh my gosh, it sounds like a whole, like a, like a gone girl situation. Oh, that's right. Oh, now that I'm thinking back to how Ben Affleck was acting in that movie. Yeah, that, like how he was so like fishy and suspicious. Oh, that, yeah. And oh. the cops immediately are like. He's not acting like how a husband is supposed to act. Yeah. But you know what's funny about that? Not everybody reacts the same. Some yes. people, like, I don't know if they hold it in, their reactions or of how things are, or maybe they're in shock or just some, not everybody reacts the same. So I don't think people can really say, you're not acting how you're supposed to. How the hell am I supposed to act? Do you know how I act? Yeah. It, so, yes, I definitely agree with what you're saying. I feel like, like, you don't know what somebody has been through. So people have different ways of expressing their emotion. There is no right way. So in cases like this and like that one, even though that one's fictional, um, it's it's like you can't accuse somebody until we have like proper, proper evidence. I know. That is true. But please, but, you know, Marty, make this make sense because he <laughs> is very suspicious. I know. On December 31st, the family, and I'm saying sh- the family, like Sharon, mother, Roy, and one of the, and the brother, but not Scott. They went up to, well, they started a vigil and they went up there. The reason I say not Scott is because all three of them were up there talking during the vigil and Scott just didn't want to be a part of it. They held the vigil at East La Loma Park near the house. That's the same park that Lacey would always walk their dog Mackenzie at. And by this time, news that they were following everything about this. That night at the vigil... News cameras took pictures of Scott laughing with his friends and smiling with his niece when lighting candles, which, again, that's just cameras taking pictures like, you're not supposed to act like that. I know. Okay. So leave us a comment if you've seen the movie, because this this is really... Did she get inspiration from this? Because when was this case? This is 2002. Yeah, because... In Gone Girl, remember that one scene where they have her big poster, her missing persons poster, Mm -hmm. and he, like, goes next to her and he smiles, and then he starts, like, kind of, like, talking to the women who are there concerned, but it seems like he's flirting with them. Oh, I don't remember that part. Uh, You know what? I really want to – I want to watch that movie again. That was a good movie. I remember that. It was a good movie. The day before the vigil, 
the police receive a tip. And it was a good tip. It seems that since November 20th of that year, Scott had began a relationship with a masseuse from Fresno. They met while on a blind date that was set up from a friend of one of his that he met at a convention because he told them that he was single and ready to settle down. That shithead. I <laughs> felt like, I didn't want to say it, but I felt like, hmm, is he being suspicious because he is having an affair and he doesn't want to tell everybody, oh yeah, I couldn't have done it because I was too busy getting down and dirty with my mistress. <laughs> Something in me just like wanted to say it, but I felt like I couldn't say it. <laughs> You're like, it's just like Gone Girl. He had a girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. <Ugh. laughs> so that girlfriend, her name was Amber Frey. And she was the one to call police to let them know. Since a friend of hers saw Scott in a news article about his missing wife. And, she's the one who, and she told Amber about it. Amber immediately agreed to work with authorities and record her conversations with Scott. Those conversations that she recorded was about 29 hours. And now we're going to forward to the next day of the vigil. Scott had the audacity while at the vigil, New Year's Eve, to call his girlfriend Amber and wish her a happy New Year's from Paris. Wait, 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 wait. Who's in Paris? He's in Paris? He called her to tell her that he was in Paris by the Eiffel Tower for New Year's. What? He called her while he was at the vigil of his missing wife and unborn <gasps> son, Connor. While there, he calls her. Fucking If that's shithead. not suspicious or fishy or whatever you want to call it, that's, it's messed, that's messed that's up. That's fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now you see, now he is doing <laughs> suspicious <things>. Yeah, no. <laughs> Please continue. Yeah. So Scott, since he was in a relationship with Amber, Scott did tell her that on December 9th, before May Lacey went missing, that this was going to be his first Christmas without his wife. He did tell her he was married once before because she had died earlier that year. So this was a few, a couple of weeks before she actually went missing. So at this point, she's just missing. In the weeks after Lacey's disappearance, Scott had already began to change the nursery into a storage room, sold Lacey's car, and looked into selling their home. Either he's trying to move forward, or this was too much for him to be around. I, I don't know. That's up to, to you guys, to you to decide. I don't know. Yes, this is a very good case for you guys to just like drop your comments. <laughs> Tell us what you think. Right now, everybody's saying like, he did it. The <laughs> Right now, my face is like that meme where you have like that math algebra equation like scattered around and you're just like trying to make sense of everything. That's like my expression <laughs> right now. A few months later, on April 13th and April 14th, Lacey's body and then a day later, Connor's body. They float to shore, just a few miles away from where Scott said he went fishing. Lacey's remains, and I say remains because her head, neck, forearms, and a portion of her leg were missing. A pathologist testified at the preliminary hearing that her body's exposure to salt water and sea life left them unable to determine what was actually done to her and if it was even man-made, meaning there was no evidence of the cause, time, and date of death death. There were also no signs that Lacey had given birth to her son because they found her cervix to be intact, but she did have a hole on the side of her body from deterioration. So they think that's where Connor could have floated out from. So that to me, that means that her body tried to save him as much as she could from the outside conditions for as long as she could, you know? And even though his body was, wasn't bad as Lacey's, they did find a plastic tie or twine around his neck and a laceration on his little body. From Connor, they couldn't tell if it was the conditions of the water or that there was, there was actually garbage nearby in a marina. 
So they don't know if maybe he got caught in garbage and that's the reason there was an, a twine or tie around his neck. And maybe that's how he got cut. They don't know. I was going to say, like, how did he get all of that? But yeah. yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense. Mm-hmm. Once it was made known about their discoveries, the police go to find Scott. But it was a hassle because Scott, when he was finally found on April 18th, okay, now listen to this. He was found near San Diego. San Diego from Modesto is about nine to 10 hours. That's correct. Okay. I've driven. <laughs> So he had bleached his hair. He grew a goatee, was found with $15,000 in cash, had a gun, three cell phones, camping gear, and two different licenses, according to an article in People. Police didn't want any chances, so they arrested him and drove him back to Modesto to book him in jail. Yeah, he did not paint a pretty picture with all that. Well, supposedly... He said he did all that. He changed the way his, he looked and had all that just in case because the news was following him everywhere he went. So he was trying to just not be caught because he wanted to go golfing. Yeah. No. I don't, mm, that's why three cell phones and two different IDs. Yeah. $15,000 to go golfing. That's crazy. I still small fish. Yeah. At his arraignment, being represented by by Mark Gregoros, a high-profile defense attorney who had also represented people like Michael Jackson, Winona Ryder, Chris Brown, just to name a few, he pleaded, pleaded not guilty in two counts of murder. A year later, in 2004, after Lacey and Connor's death, the plea for a change in venue was... Asked because this case became so publicized. There was some primetime series made and a lifetime movie called The Perfect Husband, A Lacey Peterson Story, starring Dean Cain, who played as Scott. But Dean Cain was, well, I remember him as playing Superman in a TV series called Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. So because of all this going on, they pleaded for the new venue to get a fairer trial. The judge then ordered the trial to be moved to San Mateo County at the Redwood City Courthouse. Over the course of the trial, there were some situations going on with some of the jurors where two of them were thrown out for misconduct and a third left to do arguments inside the jury room. So a few of them had to be replaced. I'll talk about a little bit more about that later. More than 23 weeks after the trial had began on November 12th, 2004, Scott was found to be guilty of first-degree murder of his wife, Lacey, and second-degree murder of their son, Connor, despite them never finding a crime scene nor a murder weapon. In March of 2005, Scott was sentenced due to the jury's unanimous decision of death. So he was then sent to San Quentin's death row. Now, okay, here are a few things that were said during the trial. Scott's defense brought up, but it was never looked into much further, and I don't know why, but a few people had said that they saw Lacey after Scott had left that morning between the time of 9.30 and 10.45 out in the neighborhood walking their dog. But for some reason, these people were never called as witnesses. A neighbor said she was driving past the house of one of the neighbors that lived across the street from Lacey and Scott and saw a van that had three men inside there. And she thinks that Lacey caught them in the middle of robbing that house and that maybe they did something to her. That really wasn't looked into. In 2003, a Lieutenant Xavier Aponte called in a tip because he was working at the Norco prison in California claiming that he had overheard talks between some prisoners about Lacey. An investigator was sent down to interview the lieutenant who signed a declaration of what he heard and said that it was all true. This is what Scott's defense attorney had said. He said that he was interviewed by the police department in Modesto before the trial started. He told them 
of the conversation he had overheard of these inmates that appeared to align with the theory that Lacey was murdered by burglars. He claims that one of the burglars said they seen Lacey and threatened her. But when they spoke with the burglars that were at the neighbor's house, they said that they were there on the 26th, not the 24th. And they never brought Lieutenant Aponte to testify because he then decided to back out of his story and say that it, he wasn't sure of what he heard of. Scott's defense team even reenacted how Scott could have done it. They used a, this is the size of his boat, it was a 14 foot long aluminum boat. And they got a dummy size of, or figure of Lacey. And they went into the marina and they reenacted of throwing her off the boat. By them reenacting all of this and videotaping themselves, it was showing how impossible it would have been for Scott to have done this in a small boat without capsizing. I was going to say that that doesn't really make sense. It doesn't. But because prosecutors were not allowed at the taping of this reenactment, it was dismissed at court. Sloppy on the court's mm -hmm. part. Then a reenactment of a pregnant woman being fitted inside of a truck's toolbox. That was permitted. That was allowed. <laughs> I love your face. You're like, ah, uh, ah. what? <laughs> yes. They're, I, I don't know. Okay, so there They're was picking also... picking and choosing. Yes, yeah. There was also... Remember, there was, they were using tracking dogs. Some of that, of what the dogs tracked, wasn't used in the trial. For example, some of the scent from the shop, of her scent at the shop, and her scent from the home. But four days after she vanished, they had her scent at the, mar at the marina. But that was used in the trial. In my opinion, I believe her scent was there because he lived with her. Her scent was all over him. So wherever he goes, she will kind of be there. Because remember, I my opinion, I believe in the whole secondhand transfer thing. I, I agree, yes. That's why I believe that they scented that she was there. Now we're going to skip many years and go to 2020, 2021 where the California Supreme Court, remember they sent sentenced him to death, they overturned Scott Peterson's death sentence from death to life in prison. And now for more recent, as of January of this year, Scott's defense wanted to test these items. There was a bloodstained mattress found in a burned out van that was nearby the Peterson's house. That was denied because the judge said there was no new technology that would change the results. Testing of a hammer and a work glove found in a neighbor's home after their robbery. That was denied. There was a Target cement bag, duct tape four packages of debris from that bag, duct tape from the bay, a black tarp that was found 20 feet away from where Lacey's body was found. Denied. The twine found around Connor's neck denied. But the judge did grant that a 15 and a half inch long tape that was found on the outside of Lacey's pants during her autopsy to be tested. The only thing that they allowed. Why? I don't know. I know I heard that the prosecutors, they argued that there was no need because none of those items were used to convict Scott. And that Lacey's family needs peace and they deserve the right for this case to be done with and not brought back, brought back up. But what, but what about Scott, even though he did some dickish things, but I mean, what if you're putting somebody, an innocent person? Well, that's why Scott's defense, they try to argue that they want to look into that mattress to see if that blood could be, you know, could possibly belong to Lacey. They want to see if maybe she was in back of that van. Uh, maybe the items of the garbage that was found in the marina, maybe that could be traced back to the van. That's why they are, they're arguing for that, but no. So also, remember, I'm going to go back to one of the jurors when I said I want to talk about the jurors. So there was one juror, uh, I know her last name was Nice, but since she had bright red hair, people called nicknamed her Strawberry Shortcake. That's what everybody reminds her, remembers her of. Okay. 
So she was one of them that said yes to death row. She wasn't truthful. She was actually a victim of domestic violence while she was pregnant from her boyfriend in 2001, the year prior to this happening. She tried to say that she didn't even think about her case while being a juror for Lacey's case. She lied that she was ever a victim of crime or that she was ever involved in a lawsuit because she did put a restraining order against her ex, according to ABC News. So they want to redo it because she was... Yeah, she she wasn't supposed to be there. No, she wasn't. Yeah, because they ask you questions before you're even there. And and that's weird and, for her. Like, yeah. come on, you. what happened to you was a year prior, and you're like, oh, I didn't even think about that. She's pregnant, and there was, she was murdered. You know you're lying. Yeah. So with now, as of, I think I just read yesterday, the day before, uh, with all that, uh, they're waiting now for the judge to select a place to test the tape that was found on Lacey's pants. So now we're just going to wait and see. So it's still going. Yes. It's still ongoing. Okay. I just, I don't know. I feel like there, there's possibly a, an innocent man in prison. I feel like they should test these things because, yes, Lacey's gone, but we, well, they need to put the right person, whoever did this, behind bars. That's why it's, I didn't know this until maybe recently, that there's actually a, a big group of people who believe Scott didn't do this. Like, he's innocent. At first, when I heard this, I was like, that's baloney. He completely did this. But looking into the case more, I was like, did he, maybe he didn't do it? Because they saw, people said they seen her after he left, and she was out walking their dog. Yeah, I feel like we need, they should do like another trial. They need a redo. They, I think they should. They need to. Especially now with, that was 2002. We're in 2024. I'm pretty sure they've updated DNA cases yes. and everything. Test the things. Yeah. If. But if I'm not trying to say he is fully innocent. We're no, not trying to say I that. I don't know what, honestly, where to lean. I am on the fence with this. I don't know if he did it. Because some people say he did it because he was, you know, he got a girlfriend. He was with Amber and. You know, he didn't want to be settled down. He didn't want to be married and with a child on a way. It could be another, like a like Chris Watts. It could be another, like, that situation. It could be like that. Yeah. But it could also be like, no, this dude is just, he's a dick, but he didn't kill his wife. So I feel like they should reevaluate everything, check those things, test them, and make sure this guy is actually guilty or we need to go and catch the actual killer there is a theory that okay well first they try to say that this was part of some sa satanic ritual they try to say that um they said that this was also connected or they try to say that this was also connected to another bay area woman pregnant woman she's still considered missing but i think she's i think she's no or they found her and they were trying to connect it because she was also pregnant around that same area they were saying that the whole girlfriend, he just didn't want to be married and having a baby. He wanted to be single or be that single life again. It's It could be either or, honestly. But I feel like they should do another a redo. They should. They I, need to. They need to. Especially with that one juror mm -hmm. doing that. No. The correct thing would Dude, be to. Dude, she's lying. Come on. The correct it's, thing would be just testing the whole thing, getting new jurors. Because why wouldn't you? I don't know. I don't know how judges think. I don't know their thought process. I don't know the rules. But I don't know why it would be so hard to test blood that was found on a mattress that belonged in a burned van. Or on a hammer and glove found in a neighbor's... Robbery? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe... I don't know. If, I honestly don't even know how much it costs to get it all tested. Maybe it's a... It's a cost thing i don't know i don't know how that works but I, why is it hard to get it tested yeah, just to make just to rule it out at least exactly somebody's somebody could be in prison for not doing anything i don't understand that yeah that's a possibility it could be those guys who are in there for robbery i don't yeah. know who knows they could have done this oh question did yes. they ever find her head no they didn't I'm thinking that it was 
sea life that destroyed it. I don't like calling it it, but destroyed her head. Salt water. Yeah. The life, sea life down there. They were eating at her body probably. Damn. Because, you know, you see freaking in goldfish tanks how when if one of them is dead, the goldfish already go and eat the body. Yeah. It's probably the same thing. Damn. I'm sorry to paint that little picture of what was happening to her body, but that's what I think of. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes sense. It makes you get an idea. Ugh. I'm still thinking. I'm still processing. I'm still, I don't know. Let us know what you guys think. I do want to know what you guys think. Do you guys think he is actually guilty? He really did this? Because, yeah, there was a lot of suspicious things that he was doing. That he, come on, he already changed the nursery into a storage. He sold Lacey's car. He had $15,000 in San Diego. And just letting you guys know, San Diego, that's pretty close to Mexico. Dyed hair with a goatee. Yeah. He was doing really suspicious things. Oh, Happy New Year's. I'm in Paris. Yes. While at your freaking missing wife's and unborn son's vigil. Again, a complete dick. (laughs) Right. But I don't know. We need another trial. Yeah. So, yeah, really, you guys, what do you guys think? Do you think he actually did it? Do you, are you maybe one of those people who think he's actually innocent? Are you on the fence like I am? Because I am both ways. <laughs> I don't know. Again, this whole time, I was just um, picturing Gone Girl, Ben Affleck, and Roseman Pike. Just like that whole situation. He didn't know what the... Well, they were saying he wasn't reacting properly. He was smiling, yeah. flirting with women. He had a girlfriend. But in his... Wasn't he more relieved that she was gone? Was she? I don't remember the... Actually. Yeah, because I mean... In the in that their marriage was already going downhill. So, mm-hmm. but even if your marriage is going downhill, if you know you have a history with that person, and if all of a sudden they're missing, you're like, holy, sh- where the hell are they? Where are they? A sane person would still be like, well, like even if there's no affection there anymore, like loving affection, a sane person would be like still somewhat worried. I'm yeah. assuming. Yeah, but then that's also talking for them again. Like, you should be acting like this. <laughs> I'm always I, like, I swear, I am never on either side of something. I'm a freaking Neapolitan ice cream girl where I'm just like, just put it all together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But yeah, yeah, just let us know. Let us know if you guys want to hear another crime and want us to look into something else. And again, thank you, Jennifer, for recommending it on, I think you recommended it on our Spotify comments. You can actually request or ask a question on there. And I think you also asked for it on YouTube. So thank you. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, Anybody else who wants us to do something, I didn't know you could do that. We'll send those in so we can actually get ideas for cases to present. Yeah. Submit them. If I'm not looking, I'm pretty sure Amadi is, and one of us will do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Without that being said, be well. Be safe. And see you next time. Bye. Bye.